Hey, you've tuned in to the G Free and Happy Show. Tonight we are talking about wine and the myth that there is gluten in wine with my guest, Natalie, the winemaker, alongside with her dad in the family owned business of La. La te- Wait, how do you say it, Natalie? Leta, Leta Creek Wine Cellars. Stay tuned. Hey, and welcome to the G Free and Happy Show that happens every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. I'm your host, Kathy, and I have been gluten free for five years now. And as you can tell, I have wine tonight. I'm very thrilled to have wine. This is my first winery that I am um, talking to tonight. And I want to show these beautiful bottles that I received today. I'm not allowed to put bottles on this table here because of all the equipment, but I can show you here. Gorgeous. I have a Chardonnay and a red, a Monarch red, by the way, it's amazing. I am drinking, I am drinking the Chardonnay now. Uh, so, so Leta, I love that name, winery. Well, um, Natalie, the winemaker with her dad, but we're just talking to Natalie tonight uh, all about the myth. And I have seen a ton of things about having wheat in barrels, wine barrels, as they are um, sitting there for years or whatever. And so a lot of people are scared to have wine. And I want to tell you that um, I've never heard of this. Um, I've, I've talked to many winemakers, but nobody could say why. So Natalie actually has some answers for us tonight. And I want to talk to her about yeast too, because that's another myth, hopefully. Because I've been drinking wine forever, and I've always been told it was gluten-free, and I've enjoyed it immensely. We'll be talking to Natalie in just a few minutes. But first, episode 58 of the G Free and Happy Show is brought to you by Oval Eye TV. Oval Eye TV believes in building community through shared experiences. We produce professional live webcasts that bring tribes together. Visit Oval Eye TV today. And by the way, if you've noticed, well, the signs in front, I've got the Seahawks on because it's going to be um, the big Super Bowl happening on Sunday this week. So uh, I thought I'd bring my Seahawks cheer here tonight. So uh, we're going to talk to Natalie now, who is from Washington State, too. Hi, Natalie. Hi. i got to get my wine. <laughs> okay, as I talk to you. And you have your wine? Yes, I do, of course. Okay. Yay, cheers. Cheers. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, I am... Uh, 31 years old. I've been in the wine business, well, really my whole life. My dad started um, Lake Talk Creek Wine Cellars 32 years ago. So I've been, he tells stories of pulling pallets away in the warehouse and finding Barbie shoes and all that everywhere. So I would climb on the pallets as a kid and, and play. Um, I started working when I was 14. I was doing the bottling line and miscellaneous tasks like that. Um, and then when I was in college, I started working full time in uh, 2003. And so I then started doing more of the winemaking there and graduated in 2005 and became <clears throat> really then assistant winemaker at that point and have been doing that ever since. And uh, my dad now officially calls me winemaker rather than assistant winemaker. So pretty good there. <laughs> well, congratulations and hello, winemaker. Yes. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, oh, this happy. is an excellent wine. Did you make this wine? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, um, basically it's just my dad and myself doing everything. We've He's always done it on his own, so really I do as much as I possibly can. The pumping over a juice or wine to a tank, the um, adding of yeast, the filtering. I um, try and take over the bottling line as much as possible. So I'm I do pretty much everything. Wow. So let's talk about your dad for a minute, because there's a history on, on your website. By the way, it's 
um, LetaCreek.com. It's at the bottom there. Please check it out as we're talking or right after and order some wine. Chardonnay and that Monarch Red are amazing. Um, so tell us a little bit about your dad's history because that is cool too. Yeah, yeah. My dad has been in the business for over 40 years. He, um, he started out in Southern California at um, Franzia Brothers and Gallo Winery. He was the microbiologist and then um, moved up north to Parducci Winery where they, um, they taught him his winemaking skills there. He was, he was brought on because back then they used preservatives in wine and he was teaching them how to sterile filter so they didn't need to use preservatives anymore. That's so he huge. was, yeah, yeah. He was teaching them that while he was learning the nitty gritty of winemaking. Wow. And then, um, didn't he work for a couple different wineries? Yeah, he had um, the big wineries, Gallo, and then the other one is Franzia Brother, and then Parducci Wineries, where he learned his skills. And then he came up to Washington State. Actually, he crossed the border on the day Mount St. Helens blew. And my mom tells the story of she sees the plume and she was, oh, no, we don't have time to see that. We'll see that attraction later, not knowing it was. <laughs> like the big it was, <laughs> Yeah, and so they, they had to stay over in Tri-Cities for a few days while roads were cleared and things like that. And then... They started, um, he was a winemaker for a winery called Warden's Winery, which is no longer in business. And oh. after a few years, they decided they wanted, he wanted to start his own. And so he left and started Leitah Creek and Hoag Cellars at the same time. And Hoag Cellars and Leitah Creek then departed ways in, um, a few years after that. Wow. And then that's when he started your, and how many years? Since 32. 19, 32 19. years. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one of the oldest wineries then in Washington State? Yes, yeah, we, um, we're number 35 of wineries, and now there's over 750, so. I had yes. no idea there was that many wineries. Yeah. How many, again, in Washington uh, State? Over 750 wineries. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, <laughs> and you're number 35 now. See, I like a winery for the history, too. So uh, when we go on the motorcycle this summer, uh, we have to check out your winery because I love history. Oh, absolutely. And wine, of course. <laughs> and so we're showing your wines, too. Let's talk about some of these wines, and then we'll get into the myths. But right okay. now, I want to talk about your award-winning wines. Tell us a little bit about some of these wines you've been making. Well, um, to start off with uh, my dad coming in, he brought um, a process called cold fermentation to Washington State. It's basically keeping the wines a little bit colder during their fermentation, and you get quite a bit more fruit flavor from them. And he instantly won a huge amount of success with his white wines, and then his red wines, he was heralded as one of the top producers of Merlot in Washington State and got in Wine Spectator top 100 wines many, many times. And so he's just continued that. And that was part of my education is that I wanted to learn how to make wine his way because it is award winning <laughs> there rather than going somewhere like UC Davis or even WSU in their enology program of learning their way of making wine. I wanted to learn his way. You have big shoes to fill there. I do have really big shoes. <laughs> so how is that? Pro we'll talk about the wines in just a second. How is the process of that? I mean, it's got to be a little daunting for you, too. But how is that going for you? It's 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 going. It's um, wow. It It's a lot of work because just filling those shoes and making sure you're making the wines as good as he's making them every single year consistently and uh, making sure that they're getting recognition and notice. But at the same time, many things have changed over the years of reporting and things like that. So we're spending so much more time behind the scenes of winemaking as well that you're kind of sometimes torn between the two, two avenues. And have you um, started like putting in your two cents about different wines? Yes, I've tried. Yeah. Fortunately, my dad and I have pretty much exactly the same taste. So when we taste wines and do blending, we can both, we both be yeah, that number three is it. And, and we're, we're in agreement. Whereas my mom comes in, she's like, oh, I like five. And we're like, no, no, you're, <laughs> oh, you're so your palate is out. seasoned. That <laughs> so, sounds yeah. nice. All yeah. right. Tell us some of the wines you have. Now I have the Monarch Red. Now, did you create that one too? Uh, yes, that was, um, I, as a 
um, younger, you know, 18 to, you know, 22, 23-ish, I did a lot of work um, in the taste room serving customers and things like that. And um, when sometimes a customer would come in who was, for lack of better words, a little wine snobby-ish, and we keep our prices um, less expensive because we want to be your everyday wine. So he would come in and say, "We don't, you don't have anything over $15 and would turn around and walk out. I had that on many occasions. So I wanted, when I came in, to have a wine in that upper tier range to have them try it so they could then, oh, well, this is really good, and then work their way back down to the lesser expensive wines because they are just as fabulous, just not the same price. And... And so we, that's where we created the Monarch Series wines. It came out, we had a couple different wines before the Monarch Series, uh, like a Cab Syrah, Cab Merlot. We had a blend called Venocity. Um, but we ended up wanting to change the label so it kind of set them apart. And then we started the blends and went from there. Oh, my gosh. And so that's interesting. You want to be the um, everyday winery. That's nice. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. We, and that's been my parents' philosophy from the beginning, I mean, I would be thrilled to have someone use us as their special occasion, but really most people want to drink wine every single night and we want to be that wine. I do. <laughs> okay, so, um, and you are for tonight, I mean, this wine, The I think I'll try the white tonight and again the red and I'll just keep going until it's gone. <laughs> but so when you blend let's talk about this red for a minute uh what do you do to make this a blend i mean how do you blend it all and and create this beautiful wine um usually it's hours upon hours of tasting <laughs> um, you poor thing <laughs> yeah uh, what what i do is i just set out all the wines that we have in front on a counter and start off with a basic blend of like 50 50 if it's two wines or 25 25 something like that percentage wise and then just start tweaking from there what each wine tastes um and just kind of every tweak you oh that's too much of this or that's too little of this and you can just kind of continually tweak a little bit and then end up with you know some that are like 38 percent this and 23 that or some regular numbers like 25 25 percent so is it just you and your dad too, right? Uh, as you're tasting, or do you get your mom in there and oh, uh, yes, kind of like my a, mom, when mom my, gets in there. <laughs> yeah, when your mom's in there, it's like okay, those are the ones we don't want, right? Well, yeah, my mom says she's uh, we're the winemaker, she's the wine taster. <laughs> oh, that, that's her I like profession. This family business. <laughs> yeah, so good. We tend to get um, we are very small family winery, so it's my parents, and then we have one other full-time employee so really it's the four of us my dad and I sit there for an hour kind of making blends and then we get our top three to five and have everyone come and tell us their opinion on it and give us notes sometimes we might call friends in if it's if it's something that is important like the the monarch series wines that was our first ever really blend so we wanted some other opinions on it and things like that so we called some friends and wine drinker friends who you know would love to sit there and drink with us <laughs> okay from now on you may call me and i will <laughs> taste it, your wines. It, yes. <laughs> i'll run over there um so with your background too is it a lot of chemi chemist kind of stuff that you go through or is it mainly just the the palate um a little bit of both i mean mainly um mainly goes by palate and a lot of some of that can be learned a lot of it is genetic and I'm fortunate enough that I have that nice. ability as a kid I, I don't like guava tasting things and my dad loves strawberry guava juice and he blend he would blend it without me knowing and I would take a sip I'm like yeah I can't drink this this tastes like guava and they're like what it's like this much in the container a so. star is born. I never thought of that. Blending juices to get your palate yeah. ready for, for yeah. the wine someday. Well, and my mom always prides and talks about um, how, as a kid, you know, we'd be, and I, I drank wine my entire life. I mean, you know, I'd always, I had this little tasting glass and we'd pour like a glass of Riesling, which has a lot of apple flavors usually. So we'd cut up an apple and say, see how this apple's in here and 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 things like that. So I I was growing up comparing tastes and flavors and things like that. So it, it could be partly learned, but. I love yeah. that story. That's a really nice way to teach your your daughter who's going to take over the palate. Yeah. 
exactly. It's a good story. And you need to put that on your website. I'd like to read that again. Yeah. Um, so tell us um, about now I'm going to talk about the gluten free myths, be myths, because this is a big deal. I get asked this all the time. I've been gluten free for five years. Now you have some family uh, members that are gluten free too. Tell us yeah. um, what happened there. It was your daughter, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was my youngest. My youngest has had stomach issues since birth, really. I mean, she had reflux as a child and had to be I had a walker. The only way to calm her down was walking up and down stairs for three hours every single night, and oh my, and things. And so it just continued. It never really got any better. And um, so when she was two, I decided to take the whole family gluten free just on a on a whim of reading things like that of stomach issues and things like that, and it it helped immensely. And then my oldest daughter ended up having. Um, she used to complain about carrying these books upstairs because their arms hurt and things like that. And oh, I just figured it's her not really caring much about wanting to carry stuff upstairs. But after we went gluten-free, she never once complained about legs hurting or arms hurting or neck hurting. So she had kind of the muscle aches. So it, it benefited both of them in the long run. Oh my goodness. So, and then you made your whole house, right? Gluten-free? I, I did because it, it was just too much of a hassle in my opinion to cook with you know tin foil and this and try yeah, and separate make it I was so, like yes yeah I was like no it's not worth it and I wanted to make sure you know I didn't want them to be like that gluten-free was bad that they we get to have this nice good french bread and they get they, this bread over uh, here it's and it's not very good either and and so you know I don't want them thinking that it's something bad and my youngest who's you know, because of that, I think, you know, she'll go somewhere. Is this gluten free for me? No, she's three. And she's, <laughs> she's like, three. Oh, and she's like, is this gluten free for me? Because I can't have gluten. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, no, it's not. Sorry. She's like, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk. That's so cute. Um, so let's talk about the myths. Uh, now, I, the first time I talked to you, it's like, okay, you have to answer this question and you're on my show because yeah. <laughs> this is a big myth that everybody talks about. I've Googled it. It's actually on my screen here. If I Google wine, flour, barrels, it has a ton of stuff. Um, it says wine aged in oak barrels sealed with wheat paste. This mm -hmm. is a big deal. And people are scared to have wine uh, when they're gluten free. Now, I don't want that to happen to people because wine makes me um, very happy. Hello, <laughs> Kristen. Um, so tell us about um, what your dad said about this. Yeah, well, fortunately, my dad has been around in the business again for over 40 years. So I had never heard of this myth. And he was like, Oh, well, not many yeah. have. No. And, and, um, and so what he said, and he, in all of his 40 years, he's heard of it, but he's never run across it or has even practiced it. So um, what he said is sometimes if a barrel is leaking, they would take a reed of, gla of grass, so very small, and insert it into the hole where the barrel was leaking and then put a paste, which was yeast and water, on the outside. So nothing's going inside the barrel, and it's very little covering a reed of glass, grass there and so he said you know in a huge barrel where literally bit the contamination level is going to be so slim and that happens in maybe one percent of barrels you're going to have leakage okay so one percent of barrels and so far i've talked to many winemakers off camera and i they've never heard of that so yeah. your father was the only one to actually give me an answer that i could understand and make sense yeah and to be honest, a lot of wineries nowadays use, they have barrels to use for winemaking, but it's a lot of times for show. And what they're doing is they're making wine in the stainless steel tanks and right. then adding oak at a later point. Add so, no, how, do you make, how do you add oak at a later point, by the way? Well, what, what they can do is they take pieces, like the oak barrels, and they take them apart, basically. So it's just the slats. Yes. And the slats are then strung together and put inside the stainless steel tanks. Oh. They're called tank staves. Huh, very so cool. It's much, it's much more convenient, not, doesn't take up, you know, barrels take up a huge amount of space. So you have to have a very large warehouse to be able to 
accommodate that and then they have to be redone every single year you have to redo redo them yeah you have to redo those every so that's why the stainless steel barrels came in so really you're not getting any of that now let's yeah. talk about thank you for saying that let's talk about the yeast because yeah. yeast can be not good for us us gluten-free yeah, people you know, i i've never run into any problems with the yeast you know they are um it's not your standard yeast that you're getting with breads or anything like that they are there's probably over a hundred different types of yeast you can use for winemaking to accentuate apple flavors and Riesling or things like that. We don't go to that extent. We use our 32 year old same type of yeast that we've always used, but they're made for wine. So they are going to be produced only really for wine, not contaminated with other types of yeast. That is a good point right there. Not contaminated with other kinds of yeast. It's mainly for wine. Yeah, Very they're good. all they're all cloned types of yeast, so it's they have to specially make each type. So is every winery do they have their own kind of cloned yeast? Is that part of the winemaking experience? Well, you, you can choose your own yeast. Basically, you have um, you know wine yeast suppliers, and you go through their catalog and choose what yeast you want, and you know you can choose. Uh, one yeast for your Riesling to bring out the apple flavors, one yeast for your red wine, one yeast for Chardonnay to bring out buttery flavors and things like that. We we don't do that. We've ordered the same yeast that we, we've we had for 32 years. We did an experiment when I was um, first came on. To We took two tanks of Riesling and we did one with, we inoculated one with the strain that my dad has always used and then one with a new strain. And that's that same, you know, 32 year old yeast is what tastes the best. It, it was the best for us and has been. So not going to change. That I, I had never heard of that. So thanks for explaining that. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't get to your wines behind you yet. Um, the one yeah. I want to talk about right now is the Natalie's Nectar. Um, tell us how that one came about. Well, my parents... Um, gosh, since I was in high school, have made a trip over to Italy pretty much every other year. Do you and get to go too? I'm not, no, my first my first trip was scheduled up and then I was pregnant and well, that wasn't going to be fun. So, <laughs> so we ended up not going. Um, so hopefully soon, but you know, had one kid, had another. Maybe and... your parents should adopt me. I think so. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so they whenever they'd go over, they would bring back a wine idea that they would want. So, you know, like we, um, we make a lighter style red, like it's called Elena Elena. It's a Cabernet Franc and it's meant as a Chianti style wine. So it's lighter, very much like a Chianti. We have a Moscato, which is modeled after Moscato de Asti's over there. Yeah. So the Natalie's Nectar is modeled after a wine called Ricciotto. Ricciotto? Yes. I don't and know that one. It's from the Amarone region, and it's um, very similar in the style of making of Amarone. What they do is they, they harvest the grapes, and then they stick them in bins, and they dry them for like three months. They don't crush them, don't do anything, so that it concentrates in there. And then after those three months of the grapes drying, then they, so they're like raisins, basically. You're getting like two drops of juice per grape. I mean, it's very decadent. And so then they crush them and then they ferment them there so it has the high sugar content but not fortified alcohol content like a lot of like ports so with that we don't have the space to be able to do that and so we wanted to make a wine very similar but you know somehow make it differently and um so it was our 2003 Cabernet Sauvignon we harvested it and we kept some of the juice behind and didn't ferment it didn't do anything just chilled it down and kept it the way it was, fermented the rest of it, made our great cab wine, and then blended that juice into some of that cab. And it was perfect. It was exactly what we were wanting. And so you get you get a port-like wine that's not syrupy sweet, though, and without that high alcohol content. So it's, it's wonderful. I had no idea. And that will be my next um, <laughs> purchase. So uh, now that you explained a little bit about that, can you just, I, mean, I love Chardonnay because I like the oaky. Uh, I know it's not hot. Is, is Chardonnay high in uh, sugar? 
It is not. No, yeah, it, that's uh, another reason why I like it too. It it's typically it depends on where you're getting it from. You know, big wineries like Gallo or um, oh, like Barefoot Wines and things like that. Those really large wineries tend to add quite a bit more sweetness to it, so it's more palatable. Hmm. Um, I didn't but, know that either. But we add, we we don't. We take it completely dry, and we usually. Um, it is. It's, it, it's. I think our 2012 Chardonnay has like a quarter percent of residual sugar in there. Just not a lot, but enough to to have it be crisp, but not just like have a little bit of in I, there. I have to say, this is where's the. I, it's perfect. Um, and I don't like a lot of sugar anymore. So this kind of a wine. What's a good red one then? Is the red wine that I have, uh, the Monarch one, is that another low sugar too? Yeah, all of our red wines are completely dry. So none of them have any sugar added to it either. So yeah, we have that. And then our other dry white would be our Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris. I do like Pinot Gris too. Oh, so I have a shopping list of <laughs> wonderful wines. Uh, okay, so do you uh, you have a full tasting bar, right, at, at your mm-hmm. winery? So everybody, tell us where you are and if you have any events going on, award-winning um, wines. I mean, where are we finding all these things? Well, we, um, we're out in Spokane, Washington, and we're located off of the freeway, really easy to get to, so it's... Mm perfect you just kind of hop off the freeway we're right there and then you can hop back on when you're done um and we've been there all 32 years we have um a very extensive gift shop that is my mom's forte she orders amazing gourmet food and accessories and um in fact when i started going gluten-free and i realized how hard that was for a lot of people we started carrying quite a few gluten-free items in the winery as well and then realized how many customers were gluten-free so um, you can come. We're open nine to five, seven days a week. So you can come anytime, taste our wines. We have about thirteen different varieties you can taste. We have in our we have our gift shop, and then you can go into the room right next to it, and that's our tank room. So you can see our tanks, our bottling line. We have oak ovals, and then right behind that is our warehouse. So the whole facility is right there, where you just get to see everything. And you have a wine club too. We do. Yes. Yes, we do. We um, we sent out. We have uh, it's quarterly wine club. It's four times a year, and you can choose. We have five different clubs. You can do um, whites, sweets, reds. You like it all, and then we have a reserve club. Oh yeah, the reserve reds are right there. Wine club. It's all on their website. Tell us a little bit before we um, stop here. Your your mom does amazing recipes. They are on. In fact, let me put my wine glass down. Um, I want to show a couple of the recipes because they all include, I mean, most of them include wine. And um, I've wanted to cook with wine more often, and I saw her recipes, recipes by Elena. Um, So here's her recipes here. Oops, so I went too fast. Uh, She's got sausage and sauerkraut, um, warm German potato salad, feta cheese pasta, hot pepper cheese ball see that i'm a huge fan of cheese with wine and that just sounds amazing yeah she's um she is a an amazing cook has just really perfected cooking and um one of her her taglines is really eat simple eat well so she wants most of her recipes you can prepare in 30 minutes or less and she wants you to eat good food not you know, she worked as a mom and everything, so she knows the time constraint a lot of parents have who are cooking. And a lot, of, I mean, who not many people want to spend two hours cooking every single night. Yeah. So she yeah. has those recipes. And so she um, just in November released her third cookbook. She had two prior to that that sold out and were wonderful. And this third one, um, as we were doing the recipes and typing them up, just casually said, hey, you know, we should probably add, this has gluten flour in here, maybe do a gluten-free version. And so we have a little notes on there for uh, people really who don't know much about being gluten-free. If they're cooking for someone, oh, make sure and check the bacon is gluten-free. Make sure to check this is gluten-free. Just little things that you might not think about if you weren't gluten-free. And so if we went to your winery too, uh, we could probably get some gluten-free snacks to go with our wine for our picnic. Yes, yes, we have quite a few. We have a nice display, and um, in fact, when then we went gluten free, we noticed two of our major product lines were gluten free, 
had a lot of gluten-free products. So we have like a raspberry honey mustard pretzel dip, which is our number mm. one food selling product, but it's also gluten-free. So we're Wait, like, say wow. that again. What is that? Raspberry honey mustard pretzel dip. It's wonderful. Sounds amazing. Okay, my mouth is watering and I actually need to go have some more wine. So um, did you say you had any events coming up before we hang up? We, we do. We have um, Valentine Weekend coming up, Valentine's Day weekend, and then we have our big um, annual case sale coming up from the 14th all the way through the 28th. So you can stock up on your cases of wine. We have mislabeled wines or wines that we ran out of our regular bottles, so we put it into different type of bottles and so we sell those at about 50 percent off usually so you get can get some pretty good deals we'll be all won't we all be in spokane uh ready to um enjoy some really good wine and some great food um natalie thank you so much for being um on my show tonight and i hope i can get you back and we can talk more about um your winery and the history and sip more wine sounds good to me Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so that was Natalie with, and I want you all to check it out, latecreek.com. Don't forget that name. Check out the wines. Go and order a uh, bottle and um, say you're from G Free and Happy. Um, Next week, I have a special guest. Uh, Actually, I have two special guests. I have Chef Kirsten and... um, Uh, a special photographer and we'll be talking about um, farm foods to the school Uh, the school lunches are starting to change in this country and we're going to be talking about that and some of the gluten-free options too so until next week this is Kathy with G-Free and Happy have a great G-Free and Happy Week